And welcome back to You Rejoin at 120. I'm Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 things that I learned as a student of computer science at the University of Regina. And this is going to be another one of those people that I think that you should know about. Uh, if you take practically nothing else other than kind of the contents of this video from this entire course, you'll probably be better off. Uh, because there's this one guy who has touched all of our lives. If you're watching this video, he's you know, made this possible, and that is Vinton Cerf, uh, the father of the internet. And together with Bob Kahn and Donald Davies, uh, he indeed was the, uh, I guess, progenitor of what we live with and through today, uh, the internet, the international network uh, that we know and love. Uh, and bonus, he's still alive and kicking and actually fighting for and kind of involved in uh, many things relating to the internet uh, and its future to this very day. So currently he's the chief evangelist, or chief internet evangelist at Google, uh, and he's, as mentioned, still kind of fighting to end the digital divide, uh, which uh, I've gone into in kind of other uh, mediums, uh, which I might uh, be able to find a uh, link to in the future. Um, he would have been an, or an undergrad uh, kind of at the, the level that I kind of reached uh, at Stanford when the mother of all demos happened. Uh, he knew Douglas Engelbart, which was the guy who gave the mother of all demos, kind of the, the biggest uh, demonstration of computer technology in the history of mankind. Uh, and in fact, even used the system that was demonstrated uh, in that demo, uh, which I'm pretty sure in retrospect uh, mentioned replacing checks as a payment method uh, and automating grocery shopping is one of the potential things that computers could one day do uh, if you know they were developed uh, appropriately at the time. Uh, so that's kind of a foreshadowing of things that have happened since. Uh, the he was president of the Association of Com uh, Computing Machinery, which is a great. Uh, they, they published the communications of the ACM, which is a great source of computer science news. Uh, and so that would have been again part of sort of his his background. But uh, just to kind of give an idea of what exactly did he accomplish, uh, because there were certainly computers uh, before the internet uh, in order for them to be connected. Uh, and back in those days, it's, it's worth kind of pointing out that it was called the ARPANET uh, in reference to ARPA, the advanced, uh, actually I totally forget what ARPA stands for, it's basically the US uh, military's uh, research uh, project. Um, and so there were computers and there were even communication networks at the time. Uh, there was a telephone company, i.e. one telephone company, AT&T, that owned the entire communications network and that you were not even like allowed to connect things to it. It was illegal, absolutely illegal, to connect things to the network without the explicit permission of the network owner. Uh, so this is something when we talk later about the Free Software Foundation and the kind of vision of what the future can look like. Fears that a single provider could own the entire network are founded in our history, as the history of the network itself, because this is exactly what the network used to look like in the past. But uh, in that time, there the communications was not packet switched, it was circuit switched, i.e. you had a whole bunch of people across the network who wanted to communicate, there would have to be someone in the middle who would literally have to create a, a circuit, a, an electric connection of some kind between network participants. So that connection, of course in uh, uh, electronics it has to be a loop in order for electro or electricity to flow on some level or shape or form, but this path would be created usually by, you know, literal switchboard operators, usually women, who would connect wires from one point to another to yeah. make this connection, this contact, this connection happen. Uh, and then when the call was finished or the data connection was finished, it would be cut. And then there would be no circuit between network participants. So this was what uh, circuit switching would look like. Whereas packet switching uh, is a little bit more complicated.
where the actual contents of the, the, the information sent would control where in the network the uh, information would travel. So the network would be, have, be connected in some way, shape, or form, and then the content would basically be a small packet. Of data, like a limited amount of data, and in that packet, the packet would have to know it have an address of something on the network. It have basically kind of like a postal address of something on the network where it could be directed to. That is kind of different from the circuit switching for sure. Um, so, so the networks were circuit switched. Uh, they were owned by one entity, uh, and this was true in multiple countries around the world. Uh, and although there were networks before the internet, they w involved the same kind of computer. It was usually one company who made the computers that talked to each other. So yes, there was, there were the, the military had computer or multiple computers. Uh, entities like the the uh, Mormon Church had computers. Uh, there was uh, large governments would have had computers. These computers were enormous. Uh, in some cases, they filled whole buildings. Uh, these were just very, very large, complicated things, uh, and one manufacturer could allow their computers to communicate remotely. But communication was limited, so even in those cases, uh, there's only so much that you could communicate between the two. Uh, it was not necessarily a general purpose thing that you could use for any purpose at all. Uh, and it wasn't extensible, so that if you had two computers talking, that was as far as the communication could go. You couldn't add another computer to the list. Or if, or if there was you know, multiple computers talking, again, they could only talk amongst themselves. Getting outside of that network meant using some other means of communication to do so. Uh, and computers didn't control each other. Uh, there was computers, and there was the ability to communicate, but the computers more or less just gave each other data. It wasn't necessarily a kind of group effort of computing at all. And of course, there were multiple point endpoints on the network, but most of the things on the network were people communicating with each other and machines, like fax machines, say, that weren't general purpose enough to actually do data processing themselves. And so the question came up, uh, how do we use computers in a command and control situation where you have a military institution wanting to give orders uh, and then the question is, how do you best implement computers into this situation? Uh, if you want to you know, look at a different perspective of how this turned out, uh, look at the 10 Ideas 50 Years video number 10 uh, for a discussion of the kind of brains of the heart of that command and control system. But it's worth considering that you know, this, they weren't sure how to do it. They weren't sure where computers would be really placed uh, at all. And so, and in addition to that, existing computers tended to be made by large commercial entities. IBM, you know, didn't do volunteer work. They were a for-profit company. They made big, big-ass computers, uh, and their computers were extremely proprietary. Uh, a lot of the technology involved was, was patented, uh, and Surf didn't neither. He allowed open designs. He didn't patent his network protocol. Uh, he allowed the entire world to have it and to share it uh, and to improve it. And what he was doing, what he was kind of tasked with uh, to, to m kind of implement computers in this command and control situation uh, would have been viewed as creating a large single computer, a large supercomputer that just happened to be in different physical locations. The, the view of the network as a network was something that came later. That was something that, because uh, like right now, if you have a personal computer that you're watching this on, you probably don't think about it as part of a supercomputer that you know surrounds the entire world. You probably think of it as your computer. Uh, if you you're you know more advanced than average, you probably recognize that the internet is also made of computers and that you're connecting and communicating know, buy packets uh, to other those other computers. But again, uh, this view of, of a personal computer connected to a network was not something that they were viewing things as. They were viewing it as designing a computer that was a, basically a group, or a computer capable of group, group effort with different machines kind of cooperating together. 
and personal computing was invented later. Uh, and Cerf was one of the people who recognized that uh, even before the days of personal computing happened, what the internet was allowing people to do was not allowing machines on the end to communicate, and not necessarily allowing computers to communicate, but allowing people to communicate to each other through a network, regardless of how the network was built, and connecting people to each other in new ways, in new forms, using new interfaces that did not exist yet at the time, and in some cases would not exist for quite some time. Uh, there's a video I just kind of found on the internet today where in addition to humans, uh, there's research being done to connect non-human intelligences to the network. Uh, in addition to the Internet of Things and art artificial intelligence uh, and attempts to make us be able to communicate with them, uh, also things like dolphins and elephants are being directly connected to the network and given uh, abilities to use the network so that we're able to communicate with them regardless of where we are in the world, possibly regardless of where we are in the solar system. Um, and so his kind of core contribution is kind of this view of the, the network as a network of networks as an international network of networks, as a as the network, as the a, a view of um, communications such that uh, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily depend on the low-level details of the connection. Uh, you're able to treat the network in the same way uh, regardless of how it works. And the, the kind of view of the network as agreement, as something that occurs when everyone obeys the rules of communication, as, or at least when the, the specific people that you're communicating with obey the, the rules of communication. His protocols are, are extensible enough and will work enough that you can have uh, TCP IP over, for example, carrier pigeons. You can literally strap the physical packets of data uh, that are, have written instructions to carrier pigeons, and those pigeons are, will become part of the internet. Uh, just as you or I communicating with a, a computer, communicating over wireless, over a wired connection, either way, it's, it's the same network. Uh, and it works because of this agreement that we have with our computers, the computers have with each other, to communicate in a predictable way. Uh, he's pointed out that there was no real one moment where the internet became what it was. Uh, yes, there was the day that they switched on the first host communicating process, Yes, there were, you know, the days where they laid the first physical connection between uh, you know, one computer and the phone network, or whatever. Uh, but for the most part, it's, it's a thing that has been building on itself uh, since the kind of early days of the ARPANET, and we learn how to perceive what it is as we go. Uh, in particular, uh, networks that are packet switched and are extensible uh, allow people to do things with the network that were not intended by the original designer. So the telephone company never designed their phone system with the intent of having computers talk to each other over it. That was not the point. It was to have human beings pay the telephone company so that they could talk to each other with their voices. There was none of this uh, kind of use of computers even imagined at the time. Uh, so very quickly, by as early as 1979, there were pop-up ads. I mean, you can't even imagine what a pop-up ad would even be in 1979, uh, considering how few computers were kind of connected at the time. But still, even as early as that, that was something that came up. Uh, he certainly didn't like the idea of pop-up windows, but again, it, it just, this is something that was allowed by the logic of how the network was designed, somebody did it, and then was quickly told not to ever do it again, and then was followed by millions of you know, people who did the same thing later on. Uh, he did work for the NSA. Uh, he was part of the security apparatus. And going back to the video on uh, Bayes and kind of the secrecy behind Bayes' rule, uh, you know, he, he was involved in the kind of advanced knowledge of mathematics that the NSA had access to. Uh, so, for example, he knew how encryption worked, and RSA specifically, way before uh, the, the kind of public world knew about it. Uh, and he even wanted to have uh, encryption as part of the internet uh, to begin with, although it wasn't as high of a priority as it uh, became kind of apparent later on that it should have been. 
uh, it was something that was kind of on his mind, but he was not able to do so because at the time, encryption was still secret. There was still all these restrictions. I, again, go, go back to the Bayes video to see other examples of restrictions on math uh, kind of surrounding that. But th this was, you know, he was involved with it, that as well. So it's worth kind of pointing that out. Uh, you know, he's, he's a modern internet user. Uh, he has played World of, War uh, World of Warcraft. So, um, you know, we've, we're probably lucky that he didn't get addicted to it too much. But, you know, th this is just someone who is still here, someone you could interact with online. If you join the right chat group on the right time, you never know. Um, he's working with the interplanetary internet group right now. Uh, so, for example, he's got Mars, the Earth, and the Space Station network, uh, and they're working on having a network link between uh, Earth and the closest solar system to the Sun. Uh, so, within about 100 years, although he may not live to see it, uh, that network will hopefully be completed if we can continue to fund it and do it. Um, and, you know, it's just kind of another example of uh, ways in which he has propelled the human species forward even beyond the original invention of the internet. Um, he built the first uh, commercial email service at MCI uh, and connected the first commercial entity, also with MCI, to the internet. Um, and by the way, the internet or email system that he was involved in, uh, to this day, uh, is uh, better uh, designed than Facebook, with only really one exception, and that is spam. Uh, Facebook does kind of win out against the original kind of design of email from back then uh, in, in terms of filtering who can send you emails, but I'm pretty confident that they had whitelists at some point, so it's worth thinking about that uh, and how far, we've, or how far we've fallen in terms of kind of losing uh, the usefulness of email and uh, internet communication. But he's also done stuff like form ICANN, so kind of organized how the internet has done domain names. He's and DNS. He's involved with Aaron and the other IP address registries uh, for allocating our, our finite supply of IP addresses. Uh, in fact, the internet IPv4 uh, was not even ever intended to get out. It was just so successful at designing networks that people just adopted it, even before he was finished it. Uh, he, he did, in fact, finish a production version of the internet protocol in about 1998 or so with IPv6. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, companies like T-Baytel refuse to upgrade to it, uh, or are, are dragging their heels in upgrading to it. Even though, from the architect himself, uh, we've, we've been told very clearly this is the, the fruit of the, the attempt to make an internet protocol. We should be using that one, not IPv4. But that's kind of a, a side note. He did win, he won the Turing Award, and we'll talk about Turing later. Uh, and was kind of the model for the archi architect in the Matrix, if you've ever seen that movie. Um, if, you have, if, if you ever get a chance to kind of watch him talk, uh, he, he is actually very similar to him. Uh, they did a pretty good job on that. Um, and uh, was kind of involved in, in the reframing of network communications from one to one, as in this case, to many-to-many -many communications, which, again, can take place among many people on top of the internet. So it's not even just necessarily the fact that we're all connected individually, so much as the fact that we are all connected as a group and, and connected in groups to each other, so that you can do stuff like Ripple, for example, where you can find cycles between different subsets of the network or, or parts of the network that can communicate in certain ways that apply other certain things. All of these things were very not obvious when the network was first being designed as a single supercomputer that happened to be in different geographic locations. Uh, he's made a point that uh, we're not putting nearly enough thought and time and effort into backups and permanent data re recording. And we're especially part of uh, the kind of Google uh, scanning of all the folks of humankind. We have all this knowledge that is being increasingly sucked up into the cloud and put on computers, and we're not really putting a lot of thought into preserving it. So guys like Jason Scott are doing a really important job by uh, maintaining stuff like the Internet Archive, where they're 
trying to record history in a way that can be preserved for a little bit longer than, say, a decade. Uh, or, or in the case of GeoCities, where uh, the entirety of GeoCities just kind of disappeared one day with very little notice, and a lot of history was lost. And he, he worries about that uh, and is involved with groups trying to kind of fix that. He's also a pretty funny guy, if you ever actually listen to him. He's got a pretty good sense of humor. Uh, quote, humor is the only thing that allows you to survive every pressure and crisis, unquote. That's uh, kind of a, a good description of him in, in kind of person in general. I was very lucky in that I happened to join a group chat with him that Google organized. Uh, I think it was Google. Might have been the Internet Society. But either way, uh, you know, very amusing guy uh, in person. Uh, and some more quotes from him, quote, sleep is a waste of time, unquote. I, I mean, a man after my own heart on this one, I, sleep is a huge time sink, and uh, if only we could reduce that, that'd be great. Um, quote, in Silicon Valley, failure is experience. Now, if you fail at everything, that's different, but a failure is a mark of experience more than anything else, unquote. And that kind of crystallizes the, the kind of perception of being willing to fail, being willing to experiment, to try new things. Again, going back to the kind of horrible, horrible freedom video, if you have the freedom to fail, sometimes you can make these massive and wonderful accomplishments. Again, only once you've kind of failed a couple of times to, to kind of get experience with what it is that you're trying to do. Uh, as a kind of concluding point, a last point, as he is getting kind of up there in age, quote, uh, you don't have to be young to learn about technology. You have to feel young, unquote. Which, again, is a good point. You know, if you approach technology with the beginner's mind, if you kind of look at the situation as something that you can, you can become involved with and you can learn about, you'll have a much better time than if you are afraid of it and are kind of forced to sit on the edges of the network and only do things the way that the network wants to be done. So, kind of long story short, Go check him out. Go, go Google him. Check out his Wikipedia page. See if you can find out uh, kind of how you're connected with him. Because the network is a network of connected people. So you're probably going to be somehow connected to him. It's worth doing the work to see how. Um, and uh, so, uh, as usual, if you'd like uh, any questions uh, other than emailing him directly, uh, feel free to ask. I can try to feel won't be able to do too much on that, but I'll, I'll field any question you'll throw at me. Um, and uh, in, in general, if, you, if by some miracle you end up watching this uh, event, thank you so much for making this beautiful internet thing. Uh, it has improved the human race probably more than almost everything else ever invented. Um, and uh, as usual, there should be a Bitcoin donation address here, but I think if I can find it, I'm going to replace it with the donation uh, for the Internet so uh, Association, or one of the main Internet societies, which is also worth doing so. So, hopefully you enjoy. See you next video.